And so this was my kind of introduction. So this is the Atlas experiment that I spent most of my career, you know, primarily focused on doing research with this device. This is at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and so uh, beams of protons come into collisions in the middle of this. This is when it was still being put together, so it's got lots of empty space, and, and now it's, it's completely full with electronic sensors. So you can think of it, if you will, as sort of like a digital camera that has about 100 million pixels that are distributed in the three dimensions, and this camera takes uh, photos 40 million times a second uh, f constantly. So we've collected arguably the biggest data set in the history of science, and uh, so there's lots of interesting problems around it. Um, um, uh, or sort of, you may, you may have heard, uh, you know, the discovery of the Higgs boson that happened in 2012. So that was kind of what I was working on for you know, the early part of my career. Um, this is uh, at the CERN, uh, uh, you know, the main auditorium at CERN where they announced the discovery of the Higgs boson. Uh, and these are like a couple of the plots uh, that were used to do it. And I guess one thing you can see right away is, you know, here these are kind of one dimensional projections of the data. So you collect very complicated data and you kind of boil it down to one variable. And if you will, this is sort of like feature engineering. Like the physicists knew that these were good variables to look at because if we're making a Higgs boson, you would expect to see a little bump in the plot. And we found that bump and that was the discovery. So this was kind of a classic way of doing things. Um, one of the reasons I show this is that coincidentally, uh, the same month was the kind of breakthrough paper in deep neural networks, uh, which is kind of uh, just, it's just coincidental, but it's also kind of interesting how much the field of deep learning has evolved in the same amount of time. <laughs> and uh, so as a particle physicist, it seems like we're moving at a slower pace. Um, so we've heard about uh, you know, all these kinds of advancements in computer vision from being able to identify ob objects, do segmentation, individual instances of objects, even being able to uh, do uh, uh, depth estimation. Um, and, and as was pointed out before, this is not happening from stereo. You just have, w with one eye, you can guess because you statistically you know how big bicycles are, so you can guess how far away it is and th things like that. Um, we've also heard about generative models, and probably the one that you know, gets the most, uh, the most press are these uh, GANs, generative adversarial networks. And early on, they were making pictures that looked like this of uh, you know, ants and volcanoes and monasteries. And they look pretty good, but if you look closely, you know, the birds look a little bit funny. So this I can sort of think of as like my daughter learning to draw, you know, they, you know, they're not so good at first, and as you get older, you, you get better and better, and so now, uh, now this is what kinds of images you're getting out of these generative adversarial networks. So they look very, very impressive now. Uh, these are, you know, these are both computer-generated uh, uh, images, uh, but it's also not, not just images. We usually see images, so I had an audio version, which is not going to work, but uh, this is a generative model for audio, and it's really like making the waveform one, you know, sample at a time as a function of time, and uh, but you can't hear it, but the, the, it sounds like a human. I mean, it's basically indistinguishable uh, from, from, from a human. So, uh, so these general models aren't just for images. You can do it for all different types of data. And, uh, and so that's very, that's very interesting. So, um, so you see this going on, but I think you know, broadly, for, you know, for me, the question is why as a scientist sh you know, should I care? There's I mean, it's obviously interesting, but for doing science, what can I get out of it? And this is the kind of question that I've been working on now with like a bunch of different people and a lot of different collaborations. And I'm going to tell you about, I'm going to overload you with information, um, but uh, all these collaborators. And I think if I were to try to abstract and tell you like my big high level message, I'll tell you at the beginning, I would, I would phrase it sort of this way, is that many areas of science have simulations that are based on some very well motivated physical principles, some mechanistic model about what's going on inside. Uh, and you can forward simulate this thing, but all these things interact with each other in some very complicated way. And so the aggregate effect of all these interactions leads to some kind of new sort of semi-emergent behavior. And, uh, and so the interactions between these low-level components leads to an intractable inverse problem. So you can't invert these kinds of simulations usually. But the developments in machine learning and you know, some of the parts of artificial intelligent, uh, intelligence really are bringing a new set of tools that look like they're uh, going to have the ability to provide, uh, uh, to bridge what I call like the microscopic, macroscopic divide uh, between what's going on in the internals of your, of your mechanistic model and what you observe at a macro scale and aid in this inverse problem. And in particular, they can provide an effective statistical model that describes this macroscopic phenomena. And importantly, you can understand that distribution in terms of the parameters that describe the microphysics. 
And if you can do that, that's, you know, that's a, that would be great. So some of the buzzwords that are going on here have to do with uh, likelihood-free inference, generative models, and so that's what kind of I'm going to talk about. Some. So the way that I you know, phrase it in a kind of more mathematical way is that in the forward mode, the kind of predictive direction, that's the arrow going to the right, I start with some parameters of my theory or what my model, uh, which are, think of not as like parameters of a neural network model necessarily, but parameters of like a physical theory. Or, um, and then, uh, and, and based on those parameters, I have a forward model that predicts the observed data. And, um, and inside of that forward model, there's all sorts of things happening which I won't necessarily be able to observe, and those are my latent variable Z. Sometimes in the physics, particle physics jargon, people call that Monte Carlo truth. There's, um, you know, there's a definitely a jargon issue going on. And then based on that observed data, I want to do inference. This is the inverse problem, where I want to say something about these parameters given my observed uh, data. But sometimes it's a little bit more complicated because the model that describes the data doesn't just depend on the parameters of interest. Sometimes there are nuisance parameters. These are things like calibration constants or all sorts of other unknown things that I don't control. Um, sometimes people think of nuisance parameters and latent variables in a kind of interchangeable way. I'm thinking of latent variables as sort of what's happening inside of the simulation, and the nuisance parameters are some parameters that describe, you know, that are some extra details I need to know to run that simulation. But I don't necessarily care about inferring them. So this is a slide that Max Welling showed about uh, uh, simulators as generative models, showing pictures of cardiac uh, uh, simulators, as a simulations of hearts that are very detailed, you know, in-body simulations and cosmology, weather simulations, earthquakes and things. I, I'm gonna add, I think, an Im important word to this, which is that it's, these are, uh, I would say, causal generative models. It's not just if a, a GAN or something is also a generative model. It can make data that looks like the real data but it doesn't have anything going on inside that you can point to and like make any sense of. There's not necessarily any notion of causality, and that's one of the reasons they have difficulties like transferring to different kinds of domains. But these simulations, you know, uh, you can definitely like if you changed what the coastline of Florida looked like, you could run this, the simulation again, and it would adapt properly because it knows the physics, right? So. Um, so there's something about these kinds of simulations and these kinds of generative, generative models that's higher level than something like a GAN. So here are some other examples. You can think about how a disease propagates through a population with very simple interactions between uh, if someone is infected, they touch someone else, they have some prevalence for picking up that disease, someone forgets to wash their hands and they go to the bar and eat the peanuts and all of these kinds of things. So the, the microphysics of the interaction is very simple, but the way that the disease propagates through the population can be very, very complicated. And these kinds of drawings that I'm doing just have to do with different models where you change the details of how the disease spreads and you get all these kinds of weird network effects and all sorts of stuff that's very complicated to understand. Uh, here's an example of you know, computational topography where you have models that have to do with lift and erosion and all these things. You put in these, uh, these, uh, these parameters and you describe and you get out models of uh, you know, some topography. This is actually like Taiwan. And so you can imagine trying to adjust the parameters of this model so that the maps statistically look like Taiwan, right? That would be the kind of inverse problem that we would be thinking about. Um, this is a lattice QCD. It has to do with like, you know, what's going on inside of the proton or all sorts of uh, things like this that uh, are used in condensed matter systems where uh, the, the interaction between the different things, so like for instance these might just be spins like when you make a magnet, the interaction is incredibly simple between the different uh, uh, spins, but the, the overall effect of what's going on is, is very, very, very complicated. Um, and then this is more like what I do. This is one of these uh, three-dimensional kind of picture of a collision that produced two quarks or gluons that then turned into these very complicated objects called jets. It's a big spray of particles, uh, and they have all sorts of interesting internal structure that we would like to be able to understand. And this, you know, big and it's being observed through a few different modalities of how the detector works. I'd like to be able to study that object. So in the in the particle physics way, the the generative model, you know, like starts off with our you know, quantum field theory and the standard model of particle physics, which is all this is one nice little equation, describes all the experiments we've done on Earth since you know, before I was born. Um, and, but at the level that you can really use it and the level that I teach my you know, graduate students how to calculate, it has to do these Feynman diagrams and things. So this is the level you can do it with a pencil and paper, but you can't observe this. And if there are things like quarks, they, they physically won't be uh, around to be observed that way. They will start to radiate a bunch of stuff. And this radiation is, starts to be too complicated to do with a pencil and paper. You need to put it on a computer. And then 
Uh, and then there's another process that happens, it's called hadronization, which we don't even really know how to effectively compute, but we can measure in other experiments, and we essentially tabulate it, and then we graft it on to the end of this calculation, and it's a really totally empirical model at that stage. And this is just the microphysical interaction. And then these particles go and hit our detectors, and our detectors are, you know, sizes of buildings, and we track each one of those particles as they run through the iron and all of this stuff, and they ionize particles along the way, and they deposit energy uh, in the detector. So this, that's the simulation chain. And uh, if you wanted to think about simulating just one event, uh, you would, you, there's you know, hundreds of millions of random choices that happen for just simulating one event. So if you wanted to think of a latent space, it's very, very high, high dimensional and it's very structured. It's not like a fixed domain. It has a depend, every time you run it, you'll have a different number of random numbers that you need to use to simulate it. Um, so conceptually, the, the, what the simulation chain is describing is say the probability of the detector response given the incoming particles. But the way it's implemented is through some kind of Monte Carlo uh, uh, program that's sampling this complicated distribution. And you can think of that Monte Carlo uh, sampling as an integration over all the microphysics. And that integration is like totally intractable. And because of that, uh, we don't have an explicit form for what the likelihood function is or what the probability density looks like. Uh, so we can't, uh, so this likelihood is intractable. So what do we do? How do you do inference? And so this motivates basically this class of inference algorithms that are sometimes referred to as likelihood-free inference, which only require the ability to generate samples from the simulator and then the forward mode. Okay. Um, now there's there been quite a bit of like, uh, you know, work on this from very er various areas of science, and there's a workshop that was held about uh, approximate Bayesian computation, which is like one of the dominant ways of solving this problem. Um, and uh, and uh, so they say it's a computational statistical methods under intractable likelihoods. That's what we're talking about. It says it was uh, developed mostly beyond the radar of the machine learning community, but are important tools for a large and diverse segment of the scientific community, like systems and population biology, computational neuroscience, things like that. So, um, so there's this, liter you know, this kind of background of literature. Um, and, uh, okay, this is kind of a little bit redundant, but again, we start parameters, we've got some black box simulator with lots of stuff happening inside, it outputs some observations, then based on that, those observations we want to do inference, but my likelihood function's intractable, so what do I do? So there's broadly two approaches to solving this problem of, of things that I know about at least. Uh, on one side, you try to use the simulator directly to do inference uh, in, in some kind of clever way, which, and I'll, and I'll talk a little bit about uh, a couple of these. And then the other approach is that you try to uh, learn the simulator, um, and, uh, and, uh, and that's where things like neural networks and things like, and you know, GANs and, uh, and various other approaches come. So I'm gonna try to go through a few of these. Um, so first, let me start on the left-hand side. I'm gonna just give you a quick rundown of this approximate Bayesian computation idea. So if you knew the likelihood and you wanted to do uh, Bayesian posterior inference, what would you do? Uh, you would have, and this, this is a slide I took from Richard Wilkinson. Uh, D would be your data. You would have, a, this is probably a data given your parameters of your theory. This is the likelihood function. So you would first draw from some prior, so the value of theta, and then you would accept that value of theta with some probability that's proportional to the likelihood, do that over and over again, and, uh, and that is this, you know, that's the base of, uh, of like Metropolis Hastings, you know, Markov chain Monte Carlo type approaches. Um, and so this would be one thing to do, but if you don't know the likelihood, what, how do you approach this problem? Well, another thing that you could do is say, uh, uh, you know, draw randomly from your prior a value of theta, run the simulator, that's what f of theta is, get some data, and if the simulated data is exactly your data, accept, okay? The probability that that happens is exactly the likelihood, so it's just a weird way of evaluating the likelihood. Okay, so you can do that. This would be an exact Bayesian inference procedure. The problem is that, um, that you know, what's the chance your simulated data is gonna be exactly your observed data? Right, so if you have continuous data, you know, that's zero probability, so what do you do? So the, what the kind of dumb thing you can do is uh, generate, same idea, generate some data from your simulator, and then have some, note, some distance notion between the observed data and the simulated data, and if it's small, then you accept, okay? So now this is not exactly the true likelihood, it's an approximate, approximation of the likelihood function, and that's why it's called approximate Bayesian computation. Um, so you can do this, the problems are, if the data is high dimensional, uh, you know, then you know, trying to, this notion of distance can, could be like totally arbitrary and the chance that you generate another data point that's close by is like, 
and high dimensions, you, you just lose all control of everything, basically. So this uh, procedure doesn't really scale very well, and so you really need to come up with some like summary statistics that summarize the important parts about your data, but the whole idea of deep learning now is like to try to avoid those kinds of things. So, so this is a kind of a workhorse, but it doesn't really scale very well. Um, there's another thing that you can do is like when you're running your simulator, if you just run it randomly, you know, the chance that it produces some data that looks like yours is, is very unlikely. So probabilistic programming is a technique to try to run the simulator much more efficiently to make it look, generate data that looks like your data. So here's some code. I'm not going to you know, read it to you, but it's, a, it's real code that makes, pro, uh, makes programs that randomly put little bumpers around and then drops the balls, and then it runs a physics engine that lets the balls bounce around. So here's like, here's three different executions of this program. You know, so it ran, you know, these little animations of the balls bouncing around. That's just running the, the, this, the, the program. Um, but now I can say, uh, what, do the, what is the posterior of executions of this program look like given that I observe 20% uh, you know, of the balls in this bucket over here at the right? And so, so you extend the programming language to have these kinds of observe statements. And you can make the code basically run in this conditional way where most of the time when it runs, it's going to try to put balls over here. So these are very unlikely you know, setups but there you go, you're getting, you know, you're, you're getting the balls in the corner there. So you can, and so how does it work? Roughly, you have down here, this is like the code with the actual at the level of all the random number choices that are happening, and you hijack the random number generator, and you try to bias the execution of the code to make it produce the output that you want. And so uh, we've been developing this, uh, this, this one procedure uh, that where, uh, we, in Python, we have like a, the, the thing that's kind of controlling the random number generators, and, and to do that, we use neural networks that basically look at the output and try to figure out how to bias the n random number generators appropriately. Um, and uh, and then, then you actually, you know, the code is running, and in and, and these cases, these code bases are like 20 years old and written in C++. You know, they're not like written in PyTorch or something uh, new. Uh, and they have to, you know, we're running this on big supercomputers and stuff like that. So we are, we're able to do this kind of thing, but it's, uh, um, but okay, you know, that's happening. So it's, it's an interesting direction, but it's also very difficult to scale up, okay? Um, the other approach that you could do is to try to learn the simulator um, and uh, learn the relationship between the parameters and the, and the output. Um, and so here, for instance, I'll just talk a little bit about uh, GANs. And well, I have these other kinds of things that are here. There was a workshop at ICML a couple of years ago, and, and, and within the machine learning community, they started using this term implicit models a lot. So an implicit model is something where you can generate uh, you know, uh, some simulated data, but you don't know how to evaluate the likelihood for it. So these GANs are an example of that. Um, and so then they just say, and now this was like one of my personal successes. Now when they describe this, they use particle physics as, a, you know, as one of the examples. So, um, and then they go through a list of, uh, of different kinds of techniques people are talking about. So I talked about approximate Bayesian computation. Here you see GANs, and a little bit I'm going to tell you about this two sample testing approach and some things like that. So, okay, so in this picture where in, in the GAN uh, approach, you're starting with just some random noise. It might be Gaussian distributed or uniformly distributed. You pipe it through a neural network so that the output of the neural network is in the domain of your data. It's like, you know, images. And then you, you just, you keep trying to update the parameters of the network until the outputs look like the, the real data. Um, this generative model, you know, again, I'm just gonna keep stressing the idea that the simulators are also generative models. They run random number generators and they output data, right? But they're just, they're not neural networks, they're, you know, code written by humans. Um, so, uh, so instead of just doing pictures of like uh, cats and dogs, we can try to make a GAN that, looks, that generates data that looks like our simulation. Okay, and so, or like the real data. And so, uh, and the reason for doing this is that these simulations are very expensive to run. So if you could do it, you could just generate a lot more simulated data very quickly, and that would help from like a computational point of view. Um, the, uh, uh, the other reason you might wanna do it, here are examples of galaxies, real galaxies and then generated galaxies from a GAN. So why would you do that there? Like wh what's the point of generating some more fake data? Right? Well, one of the reasons you might want to do it is if you have a very complicated data analysis pipeline, you need to calibrate that pipeline, or you might want to calculate p-values or something like that. You need to generate fake data and run it through this very, very complicated data analysis pipeline. And, and, and so one way of doing it is go collect a bunch of real pictures of galaxies, but that's expensive, and you also only have a fixed number of galaxies, and you want to use those to actually analyze uh, 
the, you know, the data about the universe and learn something about the universe. So where do you get an independent s set of a pictures of galaxies? Well, one way to do it is have a GAN generate you a bunch of pictures of galaxies and then run them through the pipeline. So that's basically what's being said here. And so this is a, related to things like parametric bootstrap on the statistics side. Um, another thing that's in this connection, which is kind of interesting, is to the extent that the, you know, the GAN is trying to make pictures of, uh, you know, uh, volcanoes and things, I can do the, exactly the same setup where now instead of tuning the parameters of my neural network so that it looks like the data, I'm tuning the parameters of my simulation so that it looks like the data. If I can do that, then I'm finding the parameters that describe the data. That's, that's the inverse problem, right? So how would I do it? I could have the same idea as a GAN where the, I run my generative model now, which is like a simulator, I compare it to the data, and then usually what you do is you have an adversary, which is like a, a classifier or some critic or something that looks at the difference between the real data and the simulated data, and it, and it, and it fights against it, and then you're, you, that's the signal that you use to try to improve, and, and in a neural network way, you backprop all of that through your generator, but if you have a simulation like this, you can't, they're non-differentiable usually, so you can't backprop through them. So like, what are you gonna do? So, so we, uh, we came up with this technique, which is basically the same idea as, again, you just replace the generative model, the neural network generative model with a scientific simulator, and that scientific simulator is, is non-differentiable, and, uh, and we can solve that problem. And there's a trick, and the trick is kind of a simple, silly trick, which is that if you imagine like this is the function that you want to optimize and it's non-differentiable, what do you do, right? So um, well you, there's a simple observation that the minimum of this function is always going to be less than uh, the, if I took a, an expectation with respect to you know, some distribution of where I evaluate that function. And that distribution can have its own parameters called you know, psi here. And so that you can think of it as like put a Gaussian over where you evaluate the function. And then, you, and then the Gaussian is gonna want to get uh, narrower and narrower and center on the point that's the actual minimum. So that's what this plot is. This is essentially the width of the Gaussian and the location of the Gaussian. And, and the point is that, that you can take the derivative uh, of, of that proposal function, that Gaussian, uh, that, that is a tractable uh, derivative, and so you can optimize that thing, and this gives you a proxy for how to, how to optimize it. So, uh, so we've done that, and we've been able to do it with real scientific simulators, and so you know, that's a kind of an interesting direction that's you know, uh, making this point about the connection. Um, so that's sort of what I had to say about generative adversarial networks and et cetera. Now I wanna switch to this idea about using likelihood ratios from classifiers as a way of doing inference. And this is, uh, I'll spend, I don't know, time is kind of a relative concept now given the start. So the, um, <clears throat> so the, the setup here visually is that I have my simulation, there's some parameters that go in. When I run my simulator, there's all sorts of stuff that happens inside. Those are my latent variable Z, and it's gonna output an, a simulated observation X. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna feed that into some neural network but it's not, the neural network's not just going to take uh, the, the data, it's also gonna take in the value of the parameter, uh, and then it's going to output some number which is going to be a proxy or an approximation of a <laughs> likelihood ratio. And if I can do that, then, you know, then I have my observed data x, and I can scan the parameter theta that goes into the neural network, and if it's all properly calibrated, then I can use it to do inference. And then I don't, I not only get a best fit value, I also get principled error bars and everything, right? And there's no assumptions that things look like ellipses, you know, Gaussians and ellipses. I just have, I just really estimate the likelihood function. So how does this work? So if you think of just binary classification, so this is where I'll disagree with David Hogg saying that, you know, that uh, classification's not, uh, you know, binary classification never useful in science. So, um, so you have red dots and blue dots. You want to try to train a classifier to tell the difference between them. Uh, you, think, you can think about whatever was generating your red dots and blue dots, there's some distribution. I just don't know what it is, right? And uh, so that's this kind of likelihood-free setting. There's some underlying distribution that's generating me red dots and blue dots. Um, if I knew the distribution uh, for, so I'm thinking of red dots as say, uh, you know, my null hypothesis H0 and, and uh, blue dots as my alternate hypothesis H1. If I knew those distributions, I could construct this loss functional that, takes, uh, that, that says, and my function S here is going to try to return zero if it's a red dot and one if it's a blue dot. That's like what I want it to do. So I can, and if so, if when it's actually should be zero, if it returns anything other than zero, that's bad. So I, you know, square that up. 
if it's actually you know a, a, the other one, you know, the, if it returns anything that's other than one, that's bad. So that's a penalty. So here's a loss function that I would like to optimize. And if if, if this loss got to zero, then I'm I'm classifying everything perfectly. Okay. Um, so you can show that if you uh, if with calculus of variations that the function s that that minimizes this or extremizes this loss function is uh, the is what's called the Bayes optimal classifier. Here it is. This is the case if you have equal numbers of you know, red dots and blue dots. And this is just the Bayesian posterior that you're, you know, a, a blue dot given x, okay? Um, so this function, you can just show through direct computation, this is what it's gonna try to approximate. And from a frequentist point of view, this is one-to-one -one with the likelihood ratio. And if you know the Nyman-Pearson lemma, it says the likelihood ratio is like the best way to solve this problem, um, which is just the frequentist version of the same statement from a Bayesian point of view. So this is all great, except for you can't evaluate this function because you don't know these densities. But I can approximate these integrals very well from samples, right? So it's a kind of a trivial statement, but this is, this is the principled thing that I would want to do. This would be giving me a likelihood ratio and allow me to do statistical inference, and I can effectively approximate that as long as I have samples from those two different distributions. So this is the thing I'm going to optimize. So now you can just take that same simple observation and kind of go one step uh, you know, uh, higher and, and bootstrap this idea. So instead of having two uh, discrete hypotheses, red dots and blue dots, null and alternate hypothesis, I think of a statistical model that has continuous parameters, theta. Um, I can now do the same thing, but I just, I just put you know, one value of theta is the numerator, that's like my alternate hypothesis, and the other value of theta is my, uh, is, you know, my other hypothesis, and that's in the, you know, the denominator. And then, and now I have this function that takes in not only the data, but also the two values of the parameters that I'm testing. So it's a whole family, it's a continuous family of hypothesis tests. Um, and so you can do that, and then that's, what, that's where you get this picture of neural networks that don't take only the observed data in, but they also take the parameter that you want to test. But you don't know the value of the parameter, so it seems weird, like how can you evaluate this neural network, because you don't know the true value of this parameter. But you, when you get to the point of trying to do statistical inference, you're, you're making this plot and you're scanning across theta space, you know what value of the theta that you're testing, and at that point, you know, you know what to stick into this slot and you can evaluate the whole thing and you can evaluate the likelihood ratio. So that's the idea, and the thing that's nice about this is that it could scale to very high dimensional data um, because the way that ABC and things like that, they just really don't work well in high dimensions. So, so we did that event originally, and we wrote you know, some paper that I had on the previous slide. Um, and then we realized that actually a lot of times in the simulation, we can extract even more, kind, uh, more data out of the simulation than just observations. So I'm gonna try to like, walk you through that really quick because it's kind of cool. So, in the, so this is a, a very particle physics-y example, but okay, uh, if I think about X as like the energy deposited in my, my detector, and I think about how did I, if I want to think about what's the probability that I get a certain energy deposit in my detector given some parameter like what the Higgs mass is something, right? You're connecting like the parameter theta is like telling you about the particle physics and the X is my observation in my detector. I need to integrate over all this stuff that has to do with the detector interactions, all this showering and, and you know, all this other stuff. So this is this big, you know, 100 million dimensional integral that I'm never going to be able to do. And, but at the very beginning of the story, I have the probability of making these partons, uh, whatever the, the kind of Feynman diagram level of what's going on. This thing I can actually calculate. And that's the only piece in this story that depends on theta. All the rest of it doesn't care. Um, and so if, once you realize that observation, uh, then if I think about what I'm gonna call the joint likelihood ratio, so, it's give, so I simulate one event and it has mil, you know, hundreds of millions of random choices inside. I keep all of those fixed. So Z here is all the random choices in my simulator. They, they take on a particular value, so I don't need to integrate anymore. It's a particular value. X is a particular observation. And then this ratio, all this stuff cancels, and I'm only left over with this part, which I can actually calculate. So that means that every time I run my simulation and I get out one observation, I can also add to it this likelihood ratio that says how much more or less likely would this particular simulated event have been under these two hypotheses. And I can do it for any two values of these hypotheses. And there's another version of the same idea where I take the, the derivative of the log likelihood. This is called the score in, in statistical language. So it's like a tangent you know, uh, vector for each simulated event that says, how much more or less likely would this simulated event been if I tweaked the knob a little bit, um, if I changed the value of that parameter a little bit. 
So before, so the, in these plots here, x is the observed data, and before I only had two labels, zero or one. It was binary classification. I simulated uh, some events from one hypothesis, I simulated events from the other hypothesis, I label them, you know, class zero, class one, and then I train a classifier that's trying to learn the red line, which in this case is like the true Bayes optimal classifier. But it's kind of, if, in this picture, it's kind of crazy. You're trying to learn the red line and your training data are these green dots and, you know, dark green dots. In this other picture, you, you, instead of, you know, it's just the red line is the same red line, but just plotted with a different vertical axis. Now your training data are all these little scatter points. Like that's clearly gonna be a much, much easier problem. It turns into a regression problem and it's pretty easy. And then, and then there's a third direction where now this axis is the parameter value. So for each simulated point, I can say, you know, uh, how much more or less likely is it if, if I change theta? So you get these little tangent vectors. It looks like doing spline fitting. So you can calculate, so now if you put all of that together, this is kind of the training data. And you have this much, much richer data to try to fit. And it's the same computational cost when you run the simulator. Um, and, and one of the things I like here, which is like the little inset, is that this picture is very closely related to uh, what's going on in reinforcement learning. These gradients are like the reinforced gradients that you calculate. And you can think of the simulator now as the policy that's taking you from one state to another state, but instead of it being a neural network policy, it's like a mechanical, physical model that tells you how the state is evolving, but you still want to infer those parameters. So, it, it, so there's now this connection between to reinforcement learning, which is kind of nice. Okay, so with this augmented data, you can, you can construct loss functions that, uh, you know, optimize uh, based on all three of these pieces of information. And the upshot of this is that if you look at the estimation error of how well you can approximate a likelihood ratio as a function of training sample size, this is a logarithmic scale, the, uh, you can see that the traditional ones are like these green and, you know, purple plots. These are only like two years old. They're not like old methods. Uh, but these newer methods, you know, they do better with like 10,000 training events instead of like 10 million training events. So they're drastically more sample efficient, and that's very, very important for these like scientific simulations. So, so I don't know, happy about this stuff. This is, seems pretty cool. And so we started using it for particle physics problems. And, uh, you know, here's like a true likelihood, an estimated likelihood. We can estimate them very well. This is a log likelihood curve. This axis has to do with testing physics beyond the standard model. Um, and uh, what you see is that basically the likelihood curve is steeper, so the error bars are smaller, so we're more s sensitive. And if you turn that into data, it's like adding 90% more LHC data, which is, I don't know, billions of dollars. So, okay, so, uh, yeah. Okay, now, um, I have a few more minutes, yeah? Okay, so, yeah, so. That was kind of what I had to say mainly about inference, and now I wanted to kind of switch gears a little bit and talk more about the, like I didn't say anything about the machine learning models. This was all about how you, you know, the connection to how you solve these inverse problems and the kind of statistical setup and the connections of all these, but then there's the part about like, okay, well what do you want your neural networks to look like and, you know, things like that. So, um, so I'm gonna talk about what I call a physics aware machine learning models, which is basically trying to build neural network types of things that, uh, that know a little bit about physics. Um, so here's another slide from Max Welling, who is talking about, and you know, in, in deep learning there's this kind of uh, uh, difference. Rob Fergus was also talking about this, about discriminative and generative models. So when Rob, Rob Fergus had this way of uh, doing the, you know, the exo, exoplanets, which is a generative model, and Bernard Schulkopf had a different version, which was a discriminative model. Um, and one of the points here is that, you know, broadly, uh, speaking, the deep learning stuff is over here on the discriminative side. And a lot of this is happening with, you know, supervised learning. And, and here there are basically advantages. You know, they're ba basically very successful and accurate. Uh, and uh, you can learn these very flexible maps and, you know, all the things you hear about deep learning. On the other side, the more kind of traditional generative models, they allow you to do things like inject expert knowledge, be interpretable, be data efficient be more robust to domain shift. Domain shift is what as an experimentalist I would call like systematic uncertainty, like you don't know the, exactly the situation that you're running your experiment and you wanna be robust to that. Um, so, so these are things as a physicist, I, want, I care about a lot of this stuff, but all the exciting things seem to be going on over here, so like you, know, you would like to be able to put the two together. And you know, it's, they're not mutually exclusive, but, so, but this area where you try to have the best of both worlds is what I, want to draw attention to. So there are kind of a few like little vignettes that I'll show quickly. These are kind of the three things. One has to do with Gaussian processes. It's not about neural networks. And then two different types of neural networks that, in, in, that include some physical knowledge about them. So 
So let me talk about Gaussian processes first. So this is related to, uh, on the first day, there was a talk about solar flares, and they were looking at uh, you know, the spectra of electrons and the spectra of, of photons, and you, there's some unknown spectra that you want to infer, and you have a measurement model that you think you understand. And so, what, so this is the same idea. You have some true spectra that you'd like to know, convoluted with some measurement model that leads to your observed model, and then you sample it with either some kind of error or you have like Poisson fluctuations or something like that. You talked about the data noise. Those are the Poisson fluctuations around that expectation. So, um, so then you, know, you can say, this is what I observe. I think I know this. Can I back it out and get to this true underlying thing? And so in particle physics, we call this an unfolding problem. Lots of different names for this problem. Um, and when you, when you just try to like invert this matrix, it, the solutions are very unstable. And so you need to try to regularize it in some way. And so that's where these things like Tikhonov regularization came, came in. So there's another approach to this problem where you model this with a Gaussian process. And I'm not going to have time to describe Gaussian processes if you don't know. But I will say there's this very nice connection between Gaussian processes, Tikhonov regularization, and what are called reproducing Colonel Hilbert spaces. And, uh, and so there's all this beautiful theory there. And you understand a lot of things, but usually the kernels and the regularization that you, are kind of lazy, I would say. They're just like, I'm going to write this thing down and I'm going to regularize it. Uh, but we could, you know, as a physicist, I know a lot about my kernel. Um, so the, the point is that I can model these kernels, including all of this physical knowledge that I know. So here's an example that's not from particle physics. It has to do with the amount of CO2 on, on top of uh, Mauna Loa. And you see, this is the observed data. And you can kind of break it apart into like a, a gradual trend. Uh, uh, an annual modulation, uh, stuff that's not uh, like the, you know, that's not just described by an annual modulation, and I believe this includes things like volcanoes erupting and that kind of stuff, uh, and then just flat out measurement, you know, white noise kind of stuff. So, uh, so this story of the data is much more inform. It's not, you know, is much more informative. So this, the kernel that describes this is highly structured. And you can use that as a Gaussian process kernel, which has the equivalent version of doing this regularization, but it's not like a lazy kernel, it's a, it's a physicist kernel. So, and then what's interesting is that there are all these rules for how you can compose these kernels. And, and that composition, those rules of composition usually are like the kinds of things you would be writing in the introduction of your paper or something like that. So they have very, they're very interpretable. Um, in a particle physics situation, here are some kernels for some Gaussian processes, and the different components have to do with things that probably no one in this room is going to understand, but parton density functions, jet energy scales, mass resolution effects, you know, Poisson statistics, these are like physics concerns. So I can model uh, this and I can fit it to the data, and that's like roughly, you know, it, can, you compare that to, for instance, what we heard in the solar flare talk, which was, uh, you know, trying to fit a parametric model. For a physicist trying to model this distribution, people come up with these totally ad hoc functions and then try to fit them. And like they don't mean anything, you know. So, but this this has a lot of physics in it. So, so I like that kind of uh, I kind of like that kind of approach. The other one, the other two examples I have to do are in this context of jets, where you get a big spray of particle hitting your detector, and they're very complicated. Um, so, the first approach that people use for doing this in deep learning was to 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 use convolutional networks because convolutional networks are great and they solve all sorts of problems. And you can think about the detector roughly like it's an like it's a, a, an image that's been wrapped around on a cylinder. Uh, so you can unroll the image and then stick it into a convent. Um, and so this is the, these are the kinds of pictures that people were showing of uh, you're trying to do, say, classification between two different types of jets and you, these very kind of subtle differences between these two, two images. Uh, but this is not an image that you would get in an actual example. This is averaging over you know, thousands and thousands of jets. A particular jet would look like this. It's, it's totally sparse. There's only like a handful of particles hitting. Um, and, uh, and the correlations between them are all important. The size of the circles here is telling you like how much energy those particles have. So this convolutional network seems like a, not really the best way to uh, represent the, the data. Uh, the other thing is this is what the det detector geometry actually looks like. It's not like a regular grid at all. So, so there's this like coarse graining to try to force it into an image representation, which to me feels like a sin. You're like, you're, you, your data has a natural representation, you should use it. Um, so how are you going to solve this problem? So, uh, so I started working with Kung Yun Cho and trying to learn about what was going on in, uh, in, in uh, natural language processing. And there you see things like this where you have a, a diagram, you know, diagramming a sentence. And there's kind of an analogy between the, the words of the sentence being like particles and this, di this diagramming of the sentence uh, is, uh, you know, is, is some extra structure that you're putting on top, which means something. It's kind of domain knowledge, right? Uh, 
and for a particle physicist, there's a very similar looking tree-like structure that we put over the particles that are called jet algorithms. I'm not going to bother you with them, but they have all sorts of properties. They've been studied for decades, and they're like part of our, our culture. So, um, so, okay, well, maybe I can use a jet algorithm to give me this tree and to structure the data in some more interesting way that knows some physics. And so then we got these. So these are neural networks that for every single jet that hits my detector, I get a new neural network. The architecture is given to me by running this algorithm. Um, so it's like the parsing of your sentence, you know, and uh, they, you know, they look interesting. And then, you, uh, and then every little node is a little neural network node with some nonlinearity, and you recursively apply that to all of the different pieces. And that also makes sense from a physics point of view because when I think of the generative model that made the jet, it looks like this, this process of a tree like splitting and splitting and splitting, and the physics that happens at the splitting is the same everywhere. So it's like a very natural model, um, and we saw like you know very big improvements in performance from going from images to this kind of model, and they required a lot less data to train. Um, a, a variant on this, which was done by some colleagues at Harvard, was to turn it around and say, let's use the same tree idea, but let's try to make a generative model that's going to generate these jets. So you're going to generate things that look like this, um, but now instead of using like a, a like a GAN, which you just stick in. A, a bunch of random numbers and outcome, you know, a jet, it's going to follow this kind of story of the creation of how the jet emerges. And, uh, and what's interesting is that when you do that, you can go into, you know, for each simulated jet, I can go in there and inspect what was happening and they have physical meaning, like these splittings mean something. And so here's a plot of what was going on inside of the, the, the blue is from a real physics simulator about the, this variable is basically when it splits the fraction of energy carried by one particle or the other, okay? And you see it's got this, uh, this very highly peaked thing because they tend to want to split very asymmetrically. So the blue is a real physics simulation and the red is what the neural network learned. So I can even still like ins inspect and infer, you know, I, I'm sorry, uh, interpret what's going on in the generative model at a level that's at the latent process, not just the, the, uh, the observable level. So, so this seems pretty cool. And the last one that I'll show quickly was some work that I did with uh, Joan on uh, using uh, graph neural networks and this idea of, of uh, geometric deep learning. And so the idea here is that like, here's this picture of a jet with all the particles hitting. So these dots are particles hitting you, the size of the circles, the energy of them. I can think about like a pick two particles and I can think of is there some notion of distance that tells me how far apart these two particles are? Well, there's an obvious like geometrical distance, but for, you know, in particle physics, I also want this thing to be like Lorentz invariant and have all the, you know, be relativistic kind of quantity and I want it to know about some QCD. So there's this notion of distance here which is uh, motivated from physical theory. So I can use that notion of distance and I can do it for all the different pairs and this is an adjacency matrix that tells me uh, the, about the graph, the fully connected graph of all these particles and this is a, a vision of it and, and I use this adjacency matrix in the language of uh, graph neural networks. But I've, imposed, I've been able to import some physics knowledge. And the last thing of it which is cool is that I also don't have to just import it and keep it as fixed. I can learn this adjacency matrix to solve a certain task, some, you know, some machine learning task. And when I'm done, I can export that adjacency matrix and I can still interpret it as a physicist. So like I do some big deep learning process and then I come out with an artifact that I can interpret as a particle physicist. So, um, so that seems, that seems uh, interesting. So these are my conclusions is that, uh, I don't know, I think uh, the deep learning and physical sciences connection are very, very interesting. I'm very excited about this uh, likelihood free inference and in generative models for trying to solve these inverse problems. Uh, I think it's very interesting to think about how we're going to incorporate our prior physics knowledge into the construction of these models. How do we inject and extract physics knowledge from the models? And uh, I think that, you know, we, we should basically be full on and trying to go down this route and this is a perfect workshop for doing that and thank you for having me.